I'm from Florida. I'm a 16-year-old senior. And what I do is I take algae and convert it to a biodiesel in an economically and environmentally feasible fashion to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So, so the algae to oil pathway, there's four steps of it. The cultivating, which is the growing the algae. The harvesting, which is taking the algae out of the water because you can't have water when you turn it into a biodiesel. Extracting, which is extracting the lipids, which are your oils from the algae cell. And lastly, transesterifying it. Taking these oils, these lipids, and turning them into a biodiesel we can actually use. Currently in all these processes, they use harmful chemicals, a lot of electricity, and it just hurts our environment even more. So what I've done is I've reduced the energy going into it and used very little harmful chemicals, making it a green process. So the facts about algae. First, algae is what I consider one of the best biodiesel crops. It doesn't take a lot of land to grow. That right there in my cultivating chamber, I could put that in my backyard, I could grow my algae, I could scale them up and grow them larger. And about the land mass of Maine is about the size of land you need to grow enough algae for the whole United States. And what's great about algae is it doesn't take away from our food source. Because most people aren't having algae for dinner, but they're definitely having corn and soybeans. So the planting. I engineer and designed all this equipment myself. I draw it on AutoCAD, and then I build it in a machine shop. So right up there, those are my vessels. Here's a model of it. And you have a control variable chamber below that pumps CO2 through using a closed loop system. All of my materials I have are from Home Depot. I just go up and down the aisles. I'm like, well, that's usable. So that's all of that. Now with the building. The building is hard. I use a machine shop. I work with the drill press and the lay, and I build my machines. So let me talk about my cultivating chamber right here. It's a design of it. It's smaller. Usually it's in a control variable box. And these are just PVC pipe. It's double walled because in between each wall, I had either neon, helium, or natural gas. And that's because each of them let through a different light spectrum. The neon, the red, orange, the helium, the blue, green, and the natural, the full light spectrum. Now, as you can see, it rotates for both mechanical and air agitation. I have an air stone inside that produces minute bubbles of CO2, allowing the algae to absorb the optimal amount. I also have paddles, and the paddles are a little bit distant from the wall, creating turbidity, moving the algae from the center of the vessel to the outside, giving it the optimal amount of photons. Now, on the end here, you can see these. They're rotary unions, and what they allow is for this apparatus to rotate while CO2 is constantly pumped through. So that's with the planning and the building and the cultivating. So as I was talking about, I had three different vessels, one with the neon, helium, and natural. And the reason I tested those is they let through different light spectrums. Now most people would believe that I would grow the best under the blue-green wavelength because that's really high energy, but that's a common misconception. Algae actually grows the best under the red-orange because the blue-green just reflects off the algae cell, which is green, while the red-orange actually penetrates through the algae cell, speeding up the cell cycle, speeding up Calvin cycle, glycolysis, and the Krebs cycle, producing more ATPs per rotation, allowing the algae to grow to larger quantities. So as it was growing for the cultivating, each week I would add CO2, and as you can see as the weeks went by, CO2 consumption outpaced growth rate by the eighth week. So your optimal growing time is about eight weeks. Could yes. you leave that, the, the last graph up a little bit longer? Oh, yes. You get a chance to take a look at it. Thank you. It's the cell cycle. As you can see, the sun hits the photocells, and what it does is it first goes through the Calvin cycle, and then onto glycolysis, then the Krebs cycle, and then into the mitochondria where it produces the ATPs. So that's like how basically algae works. So with the cultivating, as I was talking about, it absorbs lots of CO2 as the weeks went by because you're producing more algae. Now, as I realized, as it is absorbing more CO2, the solution was becoming very acidic and that would kill my algae. So in order to balance it out, I add in sodium carbonate. And the way I got the idea is I thought of the ocean. 
The ocean absorbs most of our CO2 from the environment, but why isn't it acidic? That's because of all your carbonates, your shells and your corals, which dissolve, raising the pH to more basic neutral level. So as you can see, I would do a cell count each week. I would use a hemocytometer, which is used to count red blood cells. I'd just sit there with the microscope and count. And as the weeks went on, at the 12th week, the neon grew more than the helium, and the helium grew more than the natural. So it grew the best under the red-orange light spectrum. Now, at about the 12th week, I shut off CO2 consumption. And what that does is stresses out the algae. Sort of like a bear going through hibernation, it produces more lipids, making it plump and ready to harvest. <laughs> so, on to the harvesting aspect. Now, with harvesting, currently they use centrifusion, which uses a lot of energy, and they also use harmful chemicals. And also, in algae, they dry it. And what I did was I have a total wet process. I don't dry my algae, so I don't have to use all those chemicals. So I use simple ionic flocculation. So I add in iron powder, which ionically bonds with oxygen in H2O, forming Fe2O3, and iron oxide, which acts like a polymer sticking to the algae cell wall through columbic interactions, your van der Waals, your IFAs. And this forms a polymer, allowing the algae cells to stick together, making them denser and sinking to the bottom. I then simply dewater the remaining solution from the top with a pipette, and because I use no chemicals, I can recycle it and grow more algae. I then take my slurry, which is mostly biomass, and run it over a Namindia magnet, which is seven times stronger than your average magnet, to take out any excess iron powder, and then I'm on to the next step of the extracting. So, on to the extracting. Now the extracting part I'm very proud of this year because I invented the cellulose blaster. Currently they use all these chemicals to extract the lipids from the algae cell. But all I do is use high pressure, osmotic shock, homogeneization, and sonication. So it's really tightly sealed. So with the cellulose blaster, I have this tank. And I add in my algae slurry along with salt. And what the salt does is form osmotic shock. Because I use freshwater algae, all the water inside the algae cell wants to escape. So it pushes on the algae cell walls, releasing the pectin, making the algae cell very vulnerable. I then use an air compressor and pump up the pressure to about 10 atmospheres inside. Then I attach this apparatus. So if you see through here, I'll pass it around, there's a very small hole. And the hole is actually 1 of the diameter, the smallest drill bit I could find. So when I attach it to my tank and open up the valve, the algae slurry comes shooting out at a very high velocity through that tiny hole. And as you can see on the sides, there's horns. And that's hooked up to an ultrasonic generator. And I engineered those horns to increase the frequency of my ultrasonic waves. So as it goes through this tiny hole, it's bombarded by ultrasonic waves, totally shearing the algae cell wall and it comes out at such a high velocity that I had to build a velocity deaccelerator to slow it down before entering in the beaker below. After going through the cellulose blaster, not one algae cell was left intact. Totally obliterated it. So at the end, you can see, came out pretty fast, splattering everywhere. And then I give it a distilled water bath, and at the end, you have a lipid layer on top, <laughs> proving that my cellulose blaster <laughs> A velocity deaccelerator. It's just a tube inside of a jar, and as it goes around, it slows it down because the algae, like, as you increase distance, velocity deaccelerates. Your ultrasonic horns, did you buy those? Or? No, I built them. And what did you use to power those? Um, it's, well, I have it hooked up to an ultrasonic generator, which I didn't bring with so me. How That's many works. watts are they? It's about one kilowatt. So it's a pretty big generator. Um, yes, but I actually had, like, I tested it with that one first, but then I used a one watt one for actually powering it because I was afraid that it was actually going to explode on me because I was just thinking my garage, I'm like, okay, please do not explode. I don't want to <laughs> deal with this. <laughs> so. And uh, what did you find was the ideal wattage for your... Um, about one watt was enough to power it. But next, well, this year what I'm working on, I'm working with different, like, energy levels to see if like I could find the resonance of the algae cell so break at a faster pace. Any other questions? Do you want to move on to transvestifying? Oh yes. Keep going, that's where you I was hit. 
All right. How so, much are you selling those for? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing right now. I'm actually working on making it better and improving it because, as you can see, it looks a bit sketchy, as I would call it. <laughs> It's simply no, some of our setup. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. Yes. What, what, what really kind work? of algae are you using and where do you get it? I use spire jar algae and I've actually been growing it for four years. I first ordered it online and when I got like the little container of it, I thought they sold me water because it was clear and I was like, wow, all right, thank you for the water. But I grew it a little bit in, I have a bioreactor that I built my first year in eighth grade and it grows my algae, it's like a nursery to larger quantities before is I start to. Is that a, a high or a low lipid algae? It's actually one of the highest lipid algae compounds. It's called spirogyra? Yes, spirogyra. And you, do you, are you feeding it any kind of nutrients or anything? No, too? I am not, just CO2. That's good. So, and actually my background, that's my algae cell. I took a picture with it under the microscope. So on to the transestifying process. Currently, again, they use very harmful chemicals. And that's the big downfall with algae right now. All these chemicals and energy going into it. And what is the purpose of creating a renewable resource if it's harming our environment? It just doesn't make sense. So with the transesterifying process, all you have to do is a double replacement reaction. So you need a catalyst and you need methanol. Now catalysts that you guys use are usually like sodium hydroxide, but I use barium hydroxide. Now the reason I use that is it's a very large cell and a great catalyst, a very strong base. And in order to convert algae to a biofuel, you have to have a very strong base catalyst. So I use barium hydroxide and methanol in a three to one mole ratio to my algae triglycerides and put it in a shaker for three hours. After speeding up catalytic conversions, I shot it through the cellulose blaster one more time. Now the reason I'm using the cellulose blaster so much is a prototype for next year in which I'm going to do in sewage transestification. So I'm going to combine the extracting and transestifying processes into one using high powered water molecules as my way to power it. So as it goes through the cellulose blaster again, it's violently mixed and at the end I give it a distilled water bath and I have my unfiltered oil G, which you can see at the bottom. Now I actually burn that compared to number two diesel and it burns hotter and longer, which means it's better for our engines and it's better gas mileage. Question, uh, have you yes. tested it against the standard for biodiesel ASTM wise and what did you find? Well, I actually have tried to send it to a lab, but no one will take it from me. I don't work in a lab or have any help. I do it all in my garage. So I've been trying to contact labs. Yes? I'll test it for you. That sounds great. I'll send it to you. I really need someone to test it because right now I'm like, well, I've created this, but I don't know what exactly it is. Any other questions? So you said it burns hotter than diesel after converting it to bio? Yes. You said a three to one molar ratio, was that for the catalyst or the methanol? So um, the catalyst and methanol together. I did um, a chemistry equation to see how much of each moles I would need. And so you're, so that's, so you don't have it, so there's no excess methanol then? No. Would you talk a little more about, oh sorry. Okay. Which um, other one? No. When you said it burned hotter, did you put it through a bomb? Um, what I actually did was I burned it in this ceramic base mm -hmm. with a temperature rod in it and like I just lit it on just fire. <laughs> Great idea, by the way. Right. Would, you, would you go through the steps on your transesterification process in a little more detail? Yes, well that's really mostly what I did. So what you do is I take the lipids off the top using a pipette and the lipids are your triglycerides. So then I take methanol and barium hydroxide and I did a chemistry equation and I did it so long ago, I don't know how much of each. And thank you AP Chem for teaching me how to do this. And what you do is you mix the barium, and hydro barium hydroxide and your methanol first and then you mix it with the algae triglyceride and you put it in a shaker because that speeds up the catalytic conversions because all you're truly doing is a double replacement reaction. You're taking out the glycerol from the triglycerides and what you're doing is you're replacing it with a methanol, making the C chain longer, making it a usable octane. So, so your, your barium hydroxide is 
my catalyst. You, you like that better than KOH? Yes, I like it a lot better. It speeds up the catalytic conversions faster and it actually allows for more methanol to be transferred. There's um, a research article now out about sunflower seeds and they use barium hydroxide to also catalytic convert it and it uses 98% methanol in it so you don't have to like have leftover methanol. Do you have any clue about what type of seed chains you could do get out of this? No idea at all. all right. I wish I knew though. <coughs> yes. Um, did you say you're using water in the when you were sending it back through the? Um, no, the glass, I the give it a distilled water bath to oh, just bath. have it even out and into layers. Do you have to like dry it afterwards? No, I do not. I just use a pipette and I like measure it. I'm like, okay, hey, that's all the triglycerides. So that's what I do. Any questions? Yes. I was going to measure if you. I was going to ask if you measure the lower heat value, but no. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. So that's mostly about my project. So I also want to talk about where it's taken me, because I'm here because I've won Intel ISEF, and I was invited to talk here, and I won Intel ISEF, and it's one of the largest, most prestigious science fairs in the world, and what you do is. First you make your project, and I first won my county level, and then one state, and that state I talked to the governor of Florida, Governor Scott, and then from there I won a trip to go to Intel ISEF. And before I went there, I went to ISWEEP, which is the International Sustainable World Energy Engineering and Environmental Fair in Houston, Texas. And from there I went to Arizona at ISEF. And at ISEF, I won first and best in category in the energy and transportation category. And I also won the grand award for the most innovative project. And winning that allowed me to take a trip to the JPL in California and also work at Caltech. And at Caltech, I met Dr. David Baltimore, who is the well-known Nobel laureate for discovering the retrovirus. And at the JPL, I met the head of the JPL and also saw the Mars rover and sat in on one of their meetings. <laughs> so then, what I'm doing this year, so the future. So this, right now, I'm genetically engineering my algae cells. Those are the genetic and genetically engineered algae cells versus the natural. And as you can see, it's a lot different. I can't tell you exactly what I have done until I publish it, but it's pretty cool, and I'm testing it right now. And if you want to keep up to date on all my work, you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> so, any questions? About? Yes. What was the impetus for getting into algae? What, what drew you that? Well, I've been working with renewable resources ever since I started Science Fair. My first year I did solar in sixth grade. Seventh grade I did wind and then algae I started in eighth grade. And Florida, we have tons of algae problems. All I hear on the news is how bad algae is. So I wanted to show everyone that you could take a negative and turn it into a positive. Thank you.